Thanks, Martin, and um, thanks to the Royal Institution for uh, inviting me to give this talk and um, to all of you for tuning in. The talk is about what a strange kind of thing science really is and how that strangeness lies at the heart of uh, the things that it's able to do. So here you are at a, a public talk about science. You're probably expecting to be regaled with stories about how powerful science is. And you're completely right. Uh, science has, as uh, anybody who's been paying attention knows today, allowed us to look out uh, to the ends of the universe, back in time to the beginning of the universe, to see how this uh, whole somewhat crazy world came about. Uh, it's told us about the origin, the evolution uh, of life, the way that life operates. It's sent people to places that are extremely difficult to get to, uh, and it's been able to repair a lot of the damage that human beings have done to one another, uh, also using science. So what's the secret? Uh, how is it that science is able to do all of this? And um, let's say you're only allowed a single word as your answer. I think what many people would say, and certainly many sciences, uh, uh, scientists, is evidence. There's something about the way that science carefully attends to the observable facts that uh, gives it the power to create the kind of deep and also incredibly useful knowledge uh, that we're all now able to enjoy. Uh, if you're allowed a few more words uh, and you have to say something about what science does with the observed facts, you might put it like this. Uh, the theories that we believe or that we think most likely to be true should be the ones that we find to agree with the observed facts. Now, this is a quote, a quote from uh, a very famous thinker, uh, the philosopher Aristotle, writing uh, 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 almost 2,500 years ago. It's a kind of an interesting thought that Aristotle was onto the power of observed fact as uh, a way to discern the truth. And yet we don't get modern science, the kind of investigation that's given us all those goodies that I was uh, talking about a few minutes ago until about 2000 years after Aristotle wrote that sentence. So I'm thinking of the science that begins with what's often called the scientific revolution. Sometimes historians look back to Copernicus uh, and his idea of uh, the sun being at the center of the solar system as the beginning of the revolution. But uh, the high point was in the 1600s uh, when Kepler uh, discovered the, the, the planets moved in elliptical orbits around the sun. Galileo explained some of the physics of that, not least uh, the reason why uh, we don't simply fly off the earth since it's moving so fast. And then, uh, 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 about 50 years later, Isaac Newton put it all together in his theory of gravity and gave us a complete physical picture of the system that whose structure Copernicus had, had uh, uh, spotted back 150 years before. So this is the scientific revolution. And ever since then, first of all, modestly, uh, uh, and now very expensively, but also very successfully, modern science has been uh, producing the goods. So what is it modern science is doing, but to frame my question again, that uh, works so well? Uh, Aristotle was paying attention to the uh, observable facts. What's modern science doing with observable facts that Aristotle wasn't doing? That's uh, a question that I want to pose and build this talk around. So I'm going to, um, uh, with no attention to the fine art of building suspense, give you uh, two answers to this question right away, and then I'll spend the rest of my time explaining what those answers really amount to. So what is it modern science is doing differently? First of all, it's not just paying attention to those facts that Aristotle paid attention to, although those two, but it tends in particular to seek out a, a special kind of observable fact. Uh, that's uh, one thing. And the other thing is that Modern science excludes from scientific argument, bans, vetoes, uh, prohibits everything that is not an argument based on observed fact. Okay, well, maybe I haven't spoiled the suspense too much because it's probably not very clear yet exactly what I'm saying in those two claims. Um, so I want to say much more about what these two ideas amount to and uh, very importantly, how they go together. <laughs> 
So we'll begin with number one, with the, the special kind of observable fact that uh, is so important to modern science. Uh, and let's focus on these two individuals in particular. Um, on the left there, looking very much like a genius, as always, you may recommend, uh, recognize Albert Einstein. Uh, and then sitting next to him is, is Arthur Eddington, a scientist uh, who himself was a very accomplished theoretical physicist, but who was also responsible for one of the first experiments to suggest that uh, uh, Einstein's new theory of gravity was correct. This photograph is taken about 10 years after all that happened in 1930. So in 1915, 1916, uh, Einstein revealed his theory of gravity uh, called, not very revealingly, <laughs> the general theory of relativity, right in the middle of, of the First World War, uh, when, when the, the Germans and the English were taking pot shots at one another in the trenches. Uh, Einstein came up with a story uh, in which gravity worked in a completely different way from the way that it worked in, in Newton's theory. Uh, first presented to the world a few hundred years before uh, in a way that depended not on gravitation as a force, but as a, 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 an effect of particles simply trying to, things generally, simply trying to tr trace straight lines through uh, a space and time that has been twisted, given a, given a, given a curve by uh, all of the, the heavy objects in it. Now, I'm not going to try to explain general relativity today. Uh, that will be a different talk some other time. Uh, the important thing is that this idea was uh, very new, uh, very deep, uh, gave a completely different picture from Einstein's picture, uh, Newton's picture. Would have been precisely the kind of thing that a philosopher like Aristotle would have been absolutely fascinated by. Uh, the question I want to ask, uh, uh, first of all, is, is what Eddington did to test that theory. Now, as it happens, uh, right after the end of the war, uh, so this is in 1919, there was going to be a situation that was extremely favorable to testing uh, one particular prediction of Einstein's new theory uh, about the bending of light, the power of gravity to bend the light. The situation was uh, a total solar eclipse. Let me explain a little bit. So, uh, uh, Einstein's theory predicts that light will be, uh, will be bent rather more in a gravitational field than, than a kind of updated version of Newton's theory predicts. And Eddington saw this and thought one way to uh, look into Einstein's ideas to show that the theory, which he loved, I'll come back to his love for the theory shortly, uh, to show that it was correct or find out if it was correct, uh, would be to observe this bending by seeing to what extent uh, a star that's just not, not directly behind, but just a little bit, uh, uh, just observable um, beyond the rim of the sun, a very heavy object, to see just to what extent uh, the, the light rays from that star are bent. And the way that we can detect the bending just by looking at the stars is it will have an effect of making it look like stars very close to the sun are just a little bit further from one another then uh, they, would, they would seem to be uh, if the sun weren't there. So the idea is we'll go and we'll look at these stars right around the sun and we'll see to what extent they seem just a little bit further from one another than they seem when we, when we take a photograph of them with no sun around. Now, of course, it's kind of hard to photograph stars that are extremely close to the sun. So what was needed uh, in order to actually realize this, this plan was a solar eclipse to arrange things so that the moon was blocking out almost all of the sun's light and those stars could be seen. Uh, there was gonna be a suitable eclipse, more, more equally importantly, an eclipse where the stars in the background at the time of the eclipse would be relatively bright uh, in, in 1919. And so Eddington, with the war between, between the, the uh, uh, Germany and the, the, the allied powers only just over, proposed this test uh, where he would, he and uh, some of his, his collaborators would sail off to the places where the uh, eclipse would be total. And that's the zone shown in this, in this map by that very narrow dark line uh, in the center of the, of the uh, uh, shading there. 
So the two places in particular that Eddington decided they would, they, the t- his teams would go to are a place in northern Brazil called Sobral and an island just off the coast of Africa, Principe. Uh, off they went. Uh, uh, here's, uh, here's a, um, a photograph of the setup in Brazil. What you see there actually is uh, a couple of mirrors that are pointed at the sun and they're reflecting the light from the sun and, of course, more importantly, from the stars around the sun into the barrels of those telescopes there. The, the mounts for the telescopes were just too heavy to take to Brazil, so they just brought the essentially the lenses themselves and, um, and created this uh, kind of jury-rigged setup so that they could use the telescopes to observe observe the stars. And the photographs they were taking looked like this. This is a negative. Uh, uh, so, of course, the sun is the, the, uh, in, the, in the negative, the very white object in, in the sky at the time, a very dark object, the eclipsed sun. Uh, the, the, dark, um, the dark fringe would be the bright uh, halo of the sun during the eclipse. And then if you look closely, you can see a few little lines that are actually drawn on this photograph. Um, most noticeably uh, the ones that are just a little bit above and to the right of the sun there. And these are lines uh, that, that uh, Eddington and, and his collaborators drew to figure out the exact positions of the stars. They would then compare those positions to a similar photograph taken without uh, the sun in the picture and, and note the slight differences, if any, uh, and uh, just determine whether those differences were the differences that Einstein's theory would predict. Now, um, I've been telling this story for a couple of reasons. One is to emphasize the, uh, uh, the considerable effort that had to be gone to to actually take these photographs in the first place. The other is something that's not going to be quite obvious yet. Uh, it's that the differences they were looking for, so the differences that would tell the difference between Einstein's theory and Newton's theory, uh, were much, much less than even a single millimeter. So now they were still, they were working not digitally, but simply by hand using a ruler and a pen and these photographic plates. And what they had to do was compare two photographic plates and see whether, uh, uh, try to measure exactly what fraction of a millimeter uh, separated the stars in one photo from the stars in the other. So it was an incredibly fiddly business. Uh, They traveled thousands of miles uh, into the tropics to get these photos. And then everything hung on uh, a distance that's so small that if I try to show you with my thumb and forefinger, I'm not going to be able to do it. It will simply look like there's no space between my digits. That's how complicated it was. Still, um, Eddington performed the experiment. Uh, 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 they did run into some complications, um, partly because of that, the uh, 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 somewhat improvised nature of the apparatus and partly simply because uh, it wasn't a perfectly clear day in either Principe or uh, Sobral in Brazil. But that's a story for another time. Eddington came back with his numbers and after some interpretation uh, 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 argued that Einstein's theory had been vindicated. The same experiment has been done uh, with different eclipses, of course, many times since, and it does indeed uh, show that Einstein is right. Well, that was a lot of effort to show that Einstein is right. Uh, Perhaps, though, not nearly as much effort and certainly not nearly as much expense as this experiment, which sent a satellite into orbit around the Earth to measure another one of Einstein's predictions. In that satellite are the two most perfectly round objects ever made, which are a couple of gyroscopes, which are supposed to measure this thing called the frame-dragging effect. And uh, again, There's a long, expensive journey this time uh, into orbit around the Earth. Uh, And the predictions that Einstein's theory turns on amazingly uh, small, uh, amazing measurements of extremely small differences uh, between what's predicted by Einstein's theory and what's predicted by uh, other theories, such as simply the Newtonian theory. So again, you get that. You get this very arduous, very expensive determination of tiny, tiny uh, little quantities. One of the reasons it's so expensive is because the quantities are so tiny. Uh, This experiment, the idea for this experiment was hatched in 1964, and it was only in 2008, so over 40 years later, that the results were finally reported back to NASA. Uh, Another test of general relativity that's been in the news lately 
this is one of the LIGO installations. So this is, a, this is an installation that's supposed to detect the existence of gravity waves. Uh, there's a couple of uh, arms there that you can see that are at right angles. Each is about two miles long, and they have to be incredibly straight and uh, more or less completely free of vibration because the way they're going to pick up gravity waves is by picking up kind of uh, the tremors in space-time that those gravity waves actually are, which, again, are uh, incredibly small disturbances. Uh, and therefore, it's very expensive to build something like this. And you can't uh, just build one. You build several to make sure that um, there are no uh, false positives so that it's not just simply some local disturbance that's causing the tubes to vibrate, but really some uh, far-off astronomical event that's creating the waves. Um, and it also took an incredibly long time to bring this experiment to fruition. So the development, as with the gravity probe experiment, began in the 1960s. Um, uh, in the 1980s, it was still uh, virtually nothing has happened. It almost had its funding cut off. Finally, some money came through at the very uh, end of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s. Uh, the installations, like the one in Washington State you're looking at, uh, weren't built and operational until 2002. And then they spent 10 years making measurements and turned up nothing. Then they gave the equipment an upgrade, and they spent another five years making measurements and they found nothing. <laughs> then they gave it another upgrade in 2015, and it happened. Uh, in 2016, they detected the gravitational waves emitted by this event, uh, an artist's impression of two black holes colliding. And uh, the very next year, the uh, principals on this experiment who had, who had come up with the idea in the 1960s and who were now all almost 80 and retired from their main academic jobs won the Nobel Prize. So that is, that is uh, the science of testing Einstein's claims. Here are a few, a few examples of uh, other, other kinds of science. This is uh, uh, the island of Daphne Major in the Galapagos. It's about a half a mile across. So uh, it's as small as it looks and really no more welcoming. The two evolutionary biologists, Rosemary and Peter Grant, have been visiting that island every summer uh, since the early 70s, I believe since 1973. Um, that's quite a few summers to spend uh, in, a, uh, in a resort that does, does not have many amenities. What they've been doing is they've been observing the population of Galapagos finches there, probably the most famous animals in all of evolutionary theory. Uh, simply to see how the populations change, and in particular how, how particular traits in the populations change as the environment changes. Some years are wetter, some are drier, and they're following these populations. And when I say following the populations, they're following every single finch over the summer, uh, learning to recognize each one um, just by its distinctive looks uh, and seeing what happens to them. Now, about 10 years into that experiment, uh, they started seeing a new kind of finch that had a song uh, that was different from, from the songs of the other finches and looked a little different. Um, they kept going back, tracked that, that finch and its offspring for six generations, and were finally able to announce in 2018 that it was a new species. They had actually been on the island in a period of time when a, a new species had been created, basically by, in this case, by hybridization, by two different species of finch having an offspring, which was, which was neither, which then took a hold of its own uh, ecological niche. Okay, I'll give you one more example. Uh, here we have a, another couple of scientists. In this case, uh, there on the left, Andrew Shelley, and on the right, uh, Roger Guillemin. Uh, two scientists who were engaged in the 1960s to try to determine the chemical structure of a, uh, of a molecule that was very important uh, for communication in the brain, uh, TRH, it's called for short, uh, and we can st stick with the acronym, I think. Uh, so throughout the 60s, uh, they were trying to figure out what, what the molecular structure of, of this substance really was. Uh, uh, they had techniques for analyzing structure and so on. What made the job incredibly diff difficult was there are absolutely microscopic amounts of the stuff 
in the brain. So what each of these labs had to do as they were competing to be the first to discover the structure uh, was to truck in, um, uh, uh, in the end, uh, literally millions of animal brains to extract the hypothalamus from each of those brains to liquefy it, and then to go through the, a long, complicated, time-consuming and extremely boring process to try to isolate as much as they could of this precious liquid so that they could then unleash the, their, their techniques on it to figure out what it was made of. So uh, Shally, uh, later in talking about this, uh, said, you know, the thing, that, as he said, the, the, uh, the money mattered, but, but even more what mattered is, is, as he puts it here in this quote, the will, um, the, the, simply the task of turning up day after day, week after week for years, many years, uh, doing what is in effect a completely rote procedure, just trying to get the, a, a, a few fractions of a milliliter of the substance. But they did in the end succeed, both of them. In fact, in fact, their uh, papers uh, independently announcing the structure, which in case you were wondering, is this, uh, were published six days apart. <laughs> okay. So that gives you a little bit of the flavor of the kind of, uh, 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 the kind of observable fact that, that qualifies as evidence in modern science, or certainly that drives a lot of modern science. Very small details, uh, observation that uh, is very uh, up close or goes on for a very long time, uh, and often of very complicated structures, uh, and usually some uh, combination of these. Uh, it's frequently very time consuming. It's frequently extremely expensive. Those uh, experiments to test uh, Einstein's theory, the, the latter two ones, both uh, had, had bills uh, uh, in the vicinity of a, a billion dollars. Uh, and something else, which I haven't emphasized yet, but I'm about to, is it's very easily in any of these cases for things to go wrong. In fact, for, to go so wrong that the time spent by the scientists is, is uh, almost completely wasted. So think about it. Eddington traveled for months to get to, uh, to, get to uh, his island and his collaborators to their place in Brazil. And uh, in fact, they met a cloudy day. Fortunately, not as cloudy as it could have been, but it might have been uh, a complete washout. Um, you can spend 20 years on an experiment uh, and then simply be refused further funding. Uh, and therefore the whole thing goes to waste. That's what almost happened with the LIGO experiment to detect gravitational waves. Well, you go to this little island in the Galapagos year after year and nothing really that interesting happens. You just have a very long, boring chronology of finch births and deaths and certainly no new species. The grants were lucky, they got a new species. Or another thing that can happen, uh, when you have more than one team of scientists trying to do something like the Shally team and the Guillermin team looking at the structure of TRH, if the other team gets there first, uh, then you lose out completely. Science cares only about the discovery and the discovery is always the, the initial announcement. No one wants to hear what the structure of TRH is again, the first time is enough. So uh, there, there is, a lot of detail, there is a lot of expense, and there is a lot of risk uh, in these tiny little facts that can nevertheless uh, make a huge difference to our understanding of uh, such, such world-shaking ideas as Einstein's theory of gravity, Darwin's theory of evolution, and uh, uh, best theories of how the brain works. Now this, Focus, focus in particular on the ways that things can go wrong. And you can see that, that there is incipiently in, in modern science, successful as it is, uh, a problem of motivation, uh, motivating scientists that is. So I wanna, I wanna pose this question. Science is, is a wonderful success because scientists find it in their hearts somehow to take these risks, to devote in many cases, uh, decades of their life to uh, single projects that could simply go wrong, and that even when they go right, require uh, massive amounts of time and energy, as I put it here, life force uh, to engage in. You know, it's so wonderful to sit back 
and be told about gravitational waves or about the evolution of a new species of finch uh, in the Galapagos Islands, um, that, that there's nothing as intellectually fulfilling uh, in many ways as being regaled with, with these stories. Uh, it's so wonderful for us. We don't have to lift a finger. We just have to read the news. But for the scientist to uncover these facts requires the devotion of a lifetime. Where does that kind of devotion come from? Um, you might think, well, perhaps scientists are just very unusual people. These, uh, these, are not, these are not ordinary individuals, but rather some peculiar race that uh, uh, glories in, in mind-numbing detail uh, and endless... <laughs> endless um, uh, repeated routines uh, and in the possibility that the, the, the terror uh, of the thought that it might just all fall apart at the last moment. But I don't think that's right. I think a lot of scientists are just ordinary people, ordinary people who have somehow been transformed into the kinds of individuals who are willing to uh, devote their lives in this way, in ways that I think we, no matter how much we enjoy, we enjoy hearing about science, uh, would certainly not choose for ourselves if we could clearly see uh, what was involved. So what is it? What is it that, that what, what, what is worming its way into the scientific brain uh, uh, to, to create these to take ordinary people and, and turn them into these remarkable fact excavators. I'm, I, in answering this question, this is a big part of, of, of what my book, The Knowledge Machine, is about. I've uh, been much inspired by the work of um, probably the most famous philosopher of science of the 20th century, Thomas Kuhn. Kuhn is famous uh, for his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, famous for the idea of a, of a scientific revolution, and in particular for this for this idea that in the course of a, a, a scientific revolution, so a great change like the change in which Newtonian gravity was introduced to the world or the change in which Newtonian gravity was, was overturned by Einstein uh, or uh, say the introduction of Darwin's ideas about evolution. He, uh, Kuhn is very much associated with the idea that these episodes involved something called a paradigm shift. Now this work of course has been gainfully employed by um, advertisers and marketers and uh, business consultants all over the world. Um, but once upon a time, it really meant something. Uh, uh, but I'm not gonna talk about it here because it's not actually the idea of Kuhn's that I want to direct your attention to. Uh, uh, Kuhn had another idea uh, and the parad his paradigms were very important here too, but, but what was important is that they on the whole tended not to shift. This is that this is that um, the social structure of science, the social organization of science uh, created a kind of a framework uh, into which when ordinary people were dropped, they became exactly the kind of, of um, single-minded, uh, tireless, undiscourageable investigators that it seems we need for modern science. So here's, here's a quote from Kuhn. Uh, he says, the rules of science uh, and this is, is, these are his words, for scientists to investigate some part of nature in a detail and depth that would otherwise be unimaginable. What does he mean? Unimaginable. Uh, maybe that's a little strong. Not unimaginable, but unattainable. Uh, something that ordinary, ordinary thinkers and even extraordinary thinkers such as Aristotle and the, the many um, great students of nature who came after Aristotle, uh, things that they would simply not care to do. Uh, we've discovered a way to, to motivate scientists to behave in exactly that way. Now, I'm not gonna talk um, uh, about, about Kuhn's ideas in any more detail. As I say, I'm gonna put the paradigms and the paradigm shifts uh, to one side. Um, of course, I encourage you to uh, take a look at my book <laughs> where the story is, is laid out in full. But I just want to grab that one idea that it's something about the rules of doing science that are critical to the motivation. And in my, in my book, I identify one rule in particular uh, that uh, I suppose you could say rules them all. And I call it uh, the iron rule, science's iron rule. 
The rule is pretty simple. In fact, you can state it uh, in four words. Let me do that. It's the rule that only empirical evidence counts. Okay. What does that mean? And how could it possibly be something that would uh, have any effect on scientists' behavior whatsoever? Let me tell you. Uh, empirical evidence means uh, uh, the kinds of theory testing by going out and finding the observed facts that I've been talking about, going out and measuring the positions of the stars next to the eclipsed sun, uh, looking for gravity waves, or rather looking for the tiny little tremors that are the sign of passing gravity waves carefully documenting uh, the lifestyles of, uh, of um, not so rich and famous finches. Uh, uh, all of this stuff is, 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 is the gathering of uh, or the creating of empirical evidence. And uh, part of what I call the iron rule uh, simply, if you like, defines empirical evidence. It says, here's what it is for uh, to you go out and, 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 and uh, or what counts as the kind of observable fact that would test a theory, test a hypothesis. Okay, I'm not gonna say too much, too much more about this. It's just, I just want you to know that, the, that this rule of science does lay down the law on what counts as a good empirical test, as you would, I think, very much expect. The second part of the rule is the only, and this is, a negative, it's a prohibition on any kind of argument uh, uh, advancing a consideration in favor of or against a theory uh, that doesn't depend on empirical testing. Okay, so there's the iron rule for you. Uh, uh, one part of it says you should do this and it tells you what to do, empirical testing. And the other part says, and don't do anything else. Okay. And I want to talk a little bit more about that, the prohibition, the second part, and how it operates. So let's go back to Einstein and Eddington there. Now, Eddington, Eddington was a great theoretical, a great mathematical physicist. You know, when it, was, it was sometimes said that only five people in the world understood uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, uh, that's not really, was not really true. But if it had been true, Eddington would have been one of them. And certainly he understood it in a way that his collaborators did not. So that was the kind of mind he had. And he was enamored with Einstein's theory in particular for a couple of reasons. One of, the, one of them is interesting, but I'm going to put it aside, which is that he saw uh, the opportunity in a uh, experimental program to vindicate Einstein's theory as a way uh, to bring the two sides in the First World War back together. Uh, in, the, in the wake of the war, there was still quite a bit of acrimony. There was talk among British scientists, for example, of, of boycotting German science, uh, even though the war was over. And um, one thing Eddington wanted to do was to, um, <clears throat> was to make people see that, that in science there are no borders. Uh, he had this wholly laudable aim of, of uh, producing a, a, a British vindication of a German theory. Um, so I, I, I tell you that because I, I want you to know a little bit about the way Eddington thought, but it's not really what's important for what's coming. What's really important is that Eddington was struck by the sheer mathematical beauty of Einstein's theory. Okay, so uh, that's a kind of beauty which is hard, hard to communicate, but uh, various, various illustrators have done a wonderful job, I think, of at least alluding to it. So Eddington wanted, Eddington wanted Einstein's theory to be true because it was beautiful. And um, he thought it was true because it achieved, uh, it achieved an explanation of the way things moved uh, in space uh, in, the, in the vicinity of big objects, massive objects that, that was uh, just so lovely, even more lovely than Newton's theory. And he wanted the whole world to believe this theory uh, but if he wanted uh, to argue for this theory, he had to follow the strictures of the iron rule. The iron rule says, if you're going to argue for a theory scientifically, um, forget about the beauty of the theory, the elegance of the theory, certainly forget about uh, the, the um, 
the, the desirable moral consequences of the theory. There's only one thing that counts, uh, only one thing that, uh, only one way to, to convince your fellow scientists that the theory is correct, and that is to test it empirically. So uh, Einstein may have loved theory, uh, loved, uh, Eddington may have loved Einstein's theory because of its beauty, but in the end, if he wanted to convince other scientists, he had to get the boat. And there is the steamer that he and his whole team took out of Liverpool, um, splitting up later on to one party to go off to Brazil, the other to uh, Africa. Um, uh, almost, by the way, a, a two-month journey just to get, just one way to get to the site in Brazil. Uh, this is what had to be done if, if there was going to be a scientific case to be made for general relativity. So, so the iron rule, if you like, took all of Eddington's ardor, all of his aesthetic appreciation for the theory, all of his moral and political hopes for the theory, and channeled it in one direction, namely uh, the direction south to where the empirical evidence could be gotten uh, uh, with great, great effort uh, at great expense, at great risk. But there was simply no other choice. Okay, let me, let me um, move forward about uh, uh, 40 years or so. This is um, another famous physicist, Murray Gell-Mann. Uh, here he is, <laughs> no doubt, posed in front of some equations uh, that <laughs> he may or may not have written up there himself. But um, <clears throat> uh, uh, I want to begin with a quote from Gell-Mann uh, explaining the way he, he thought about physics. Uh, and here he is saying, saying that a uh, very important criterion for deciding what's right and wrong, for deciding which theories are promising and uh, which not so much, uh, is beauty or simplicity or elegance. Think of these three as going together. When a physicist talks about beauty, they're talking about simplicity, they're talking about elegance, they're talking about symmetry. So this was, this was Gell-Mann's mantra. And uh, it served him very well. In the late 1950s through the early 60s, he made a succession of discoveries, um, theoretical discoveries that culminated with the theory of quarks, the idea that particles that had, thought to, had been thought to be fundamental particles, protons and neutrons in particular, were really made of even smaller particles with fractional charges. These are the quarks. And... Uh, there you have another, another theory that is, is this beautiful theory that made sense of so much. In the, in the 1940s and 50s, physicists had been discovering particle after particle. All of them seemed to be new fundamental particles. They'd gone from there being about five fundamental particles to there being 30, 40, 50. Uh, and uh, I think it was Robert Oppenheimer, Robert Oppenheimer referred to what they were getting as the, the particle zoo. Uh, so you can kind of read into that expression uh, a bit of frustration. We came here to do physics. We ended up doing biology. We ended up dealing with this profusion of particles that uh, is glorious, but also uh, rather disconcerting in its variety. Well, Gell-Mann managed to get the numbers down again with some, with some other um, physicists who, who had some of the same ideas, uh, uh, in particular to... Um, uh, for many of those particles, just to a few basic ones, the quarks. And that was, that was the, the gorgeousness and the beauty of the theory was both the fact that it did that, but also the way it did it through these higher dimensional symmetries, which again, you have to have um, uh, a certain amount of higher mathematics to really appreciate. Okay, so Gell-Mann thought that beauty and elegance was showing the way to the truth of his quark theory. Uh, but... Uh, he couldn't simply write a paper explaining that the theory was just so beautiful that it had to be true. Um, he was up against the iron rule. And here, uh, his um, echoing, echoing the, the iron rule here, or expressing the iron rule, or a particular case of it is Brian Greene, um, author, author of The Elegant Universe and himself a string theorist. Here he's telling you how science works. This is a quote from the book. Aesthetic judgments do not arbitrate scientific discourse. And that's a very, he's put it very nicely here. 
Now, Gelman is making aesthetic judgments. And what's more, those judgments are very important to him in deciding what's right and what's wrong. But those judgments are not allowed into scientific discourse. Uh, Gelman can have any thoughts he likes, but what he can't do is, is put these thoughts into uh, a public scientific argument, into a scientific journal and say, here are the reasons why you should accept my theory. Uh, how can he argue? Well, as Green says, hard experimental facts. And hard here you should think of as, 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 as connoting, among other things, uh, arduousness. Um, here's one way it panned out in particular. So when, before Gelman had the, fully, the full quark theory worked out, he had um, uh, a step on the way, which was a scheme for classicals in the particle zoo uh, in groups. Here's an example, a kind of a a sadly flattened example of one of the classifications, which puts together 10 particles in a way that it's, there's no need for me to explain right now. What's, what's important here is that there are nine particles that are known of, uh, and they're all sitting in nine positions of a theoretical structure, a structure that Gelman had laid out that has 10 positions. So there's a position that is currently empty down there in the bottom left with the question mark. Gelman was able to look at that structure and say, uh, it looks to me like there's another particle lurking out there. Why don't we go and look for it? That was his equivalent of uh, getting on the boat. Okay, he was a theorist. He was a mathematical thinker. Uh, uh, but if he wanted to persuade his colleagues uh, to accept his theories, he had to get on the boat. He had to get the evidence. Now, in this particular case, um, uh, he couldn't get on the boat because the boat was a particle accelerator that required hundreds of people and, and hundreds of millions of dollars to operate. So there was a whole other team who uh, at, at the Brookhaven National Lab, um, about 60 miles east of me right now uh, in Long Island, uh, who went and looked for this particle that Gelman had predicted, the omega minus, and uh, uh, sure enough, uh, discovered it. That's how science works. So in this case, Gelman had, 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 had not gotten on the boat himself, but it was his, his, des his desire and the desire of, of his, his colleagues to see this theory tested that persuaded people to, to spend that kind of money. Um, like I say, it was, it was hundreds of millions of dollars to put in uh, months and months and months of work in the, the facility was already built. Uh, simply to look for this, this uh, little blip that you're looking at on the left-hand side here. So I think you can begin to see uh, 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 what I'm getting at here with the iron rule. The iron rule you can think of as, as being the rule, a rule in a game, uh, the science game, let's say. Uh, and if you're going to do science, then you have to play the game, okay? You have to follow the rules. Uh, and one of those rules says that the only legitimate moves in this film is not a legitimate move. Um, by all means, use beauty in your private thinking to, to um, guide your research. Uh, by all means, uh, uh, be personally persuaded by the beauty of a theory. But if you're going to go out there and play the game, you need the empirical facts. Now, scientists, of course, want to play this game uh, for many reasons, um, above all because they're fascinated by the idea that they re really will look into, the, look into the hidden structure of the world and see how it all fits together. Some of them are, are game players in other, other senses as well. Um, Andrew Shelley, the, the, um, the biochemist who was, uh, who was one of the co-discoverers of the structure of that, that molecule, TRH, uh, was obviously a, a rather competitive individual. <laughs> uh, he, he, um, he took great pride in his sheer drive to win. And you can imagine a personality like that getting into the game simply for the game's sake. Um, and then there are other reasons as well for many scientists, maybe just the desire to do something interesting for a living that results in a weekly paycheck. Uh, in any case, whatever the motivations are, when scientists actually front up to play the game, they find that uh, there's only one way to play, and that's to put everything they have, uh, all of their effort, all of their, all of their um, 
their, their sweat, their, their, their hours, their focus, all of their hopes uh, into this one activity, digging up the evidence, which could mean sailing to Brazil with your telescopes, which could mean um, going to argue in front of, say, the US Congress for more funding for expensive particle accelerators, which could mean uh, going to an island in the tropics year after year to count birds, uh, 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 or simply staying in your lab and, um, and um, tossing animal brains into a blender. But one way or another, that's where uh, all of this this uh, uh, fervor is channeled. Okay, that's how the iron rule motivates scientists or plays a big part in motivating scientists uh, to, to produce evidence which is so finicky and, and so difficult to come by. Um, but I promised you more than that. I said uh, uh, that there's something irrational about this. And I wanna finish off by uh, by fulfilling that promise. Um, that is to talk a little bit about the sense in which the science game is, is counter to reason. Uh, I've talked about Eddington and about uh, Gell-Mann. I gave you this, this quote of Gell-Mann and their conviction that the beauty of a theory was a sign of its truth. But really, uh, if you, uh, look around, read around at all, you'll, everywhere you look, you'll find scientists, theoretical physicists are, are especially prone to this, uh, uh, declaiming about the virtues of beauty as a guide to truth. So uh, uh, a couple more examples. Um, Paul Dirac here says, it's more important to have beauty in your equations to have them fit experiment. Not because he thinks that the truth doesn't ultimately fit experiment, but because he thinks that, that when things seem a little bit off, often it turns out that there's something wrong with the experiment. Um, you should stick with the beautiful idea. Or well, Steven Weinberg, uh, uh, a very strong claim. We would not accept any theory as final unless it were beautiful. The truth has to be beautiful, he's saying. I, I don't know to what extent... Uh, <laughs> These, these scientists would, would, would um, endorse the very strong versions of the sentiment that are spelled out here. But I do know that they, they uh, regard beauty as something very important to take in, into account in assessing the correctness of a theory. And here's Brian Green again, um, summing up this idea. So now he's talking, these aren't just quotes from Nobel Prize winners. This is a a, um, he's talking about physicists, but uh, uh, in particular, but all physicists, when they're deciding what to believe, what's promising, what's not so promising, uh, uh, they use their aesthetic sense, as he puts it here, a sense of, of the elegance or the beauty of the structure that's um, laid out in a theory. They use that sense to guide them. It's not their only guide, but it's a very important guide. And yet, as Green goes on to say, and now I've already, I've already um, shown you this once, but it's important, so I'm going to show you again. And yet, uh, those judgments, which are so important to guiding scientists uh, own in, their, in their own private thinking, are not actually permitted to uh, play a role in public scientific argument, in scientific discourse. You won't find them in the science journals where scientific research is published. So... Uh, in the science, now he says here, ultimately theories are judged by how they fare when they're faced with the hard experimental facts. Now you've seen already this, this can't be quite right if what we mean is this is the way theories are judged by individual scientists because we've already seen people like Weinberg and Dirac and Gell-Mann judging theories not only uh, 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 in this way, but also by their aesthetic merits. But Green is really talking about a more impersonal process here, not the judgment of any particular scientist, but the judgment of science as a whole, if you like. Think of science as, the, the, as, as an enterprise whose beating heart is the science game animated by the iron rule. And he is talking about the judgments of that enterprise. And that enterprise cares only for the hard facts. Okay. Uh, or as I've put it, in 
my forward version of the iron rule. Uh, uh, only empirical evidence counts in those judgments. Okay, here comes the irrationality. So we're hearing from scientists, ordinary workaday scientists, scientists commenting like Green on other scientists, scientists who have become famous for their achievements, like the Nobel Prize winners, uh, <clears throat> Gelman, Dirac, uh, and Weinberg. We're hearing from them that attending to beauty is exceptionally helpful, as I put it here, <laughs> a little less strongly than Weinberg, for example, uh, in finding the truth. And yet, we're also finding that in official scientific argument, we should pay no attention to beauty whatsoever. So here's this thing that is incredibly helpful, and we should ignore it. Official scientific argument, the discourse, the judgments that Green is talking about, ignore a source of information that scientists generally agree is uh, extremely, um, extremely telling, uh, extremely valuable, not the last word, but extremely valuable. And what's more readily available, simply in thinking, thinking about these theories, scientists already, already uh, appreciate their beauty. You don't have to uh, sail to Brazil to see that the general theory of relativity is, is, is beautiful or travel to Long Island and accelerate particles to near the speed of light. You can just sit in your office and go through the mathematics. Uh, yet, science is saying, forget about it. Uh, and in so doing, it is doing something which is technically irrational. Uh, here's, here's a philosopher's take on exactly what's wrong here. We philosophers would say in formulating the principles of rationality uh, that one of them is what's often called the principle of total evidence that says to you, when you're deliberating, uh, you know, making up your mind what to think about some, some um, particular matter of fact, you should consider all the sources of information you have, um, at least if, they're, if it's not too expensive to do so, given the goal. So for trivial decisions, if you walk into a restaurant, you shouldn't spend, oh, nostalgia. If you walk into a restaurant, you shouldn't spend half an hour figuring out which would be absolutely the best table to sit at. On the other hand, if you're trying to decide how gravity works, it's probably worth spending an hour, two hours, even a week, figuring out just how beautiful <laughs> the theory of relativity is and what that tells you. So the principle of total evidence says that's something that's well worth your while. I mean, you could just think about it on your way to Brazil. Uh, and yet, uh, the iron rule is saying, no way. So the iron rule is saying, does not respect the principle of total evidence. It's saying there's some relevant information you should completely ignore. That's the irrationality at the heart of science. It's irrationality, but it is, uh, to return to the title of my talk, highly effective rationality. Uh, it's precisely because of this narrowness, this focus on just one kind of, uh, of argument uh, that, that uh, uh, scientists have to uh, get on the boat, build the particle accelerator, go to the islands, uh, do all the things that they do uh, if they're going to argue for their theories. And so it is this, it is this channeling of all of scientists' energy into uh, the empirical endeavor that unleashes all of that energy uh, on empirical testing, which it turns out is what we need to make pro progress. Uh, it's really those, to go back to the beginning of the talk, those tiny little facts, which are so expensive or time consuming or risky to find out that push science forward. The way scientists are persuaded to devote their lives to those facts is by being given literally no other choice than to do so. If you wanna be a scientist, that's what you do, okay? But it takes an irrationally narrow rule to to, uh, or to, to lay down the law in that way is to lay down an irrationally narrow rule. So to create modern science, uh, we humans had to, had to uh, come across somehow this, this fact that for human beings, for given our kinds of intellects uh, as regular ordinary human beings, uh, an irrationally narrow rule will work uh, extremely well well, I should just go with go full on, as I have on the slide, and say incredibly well in uh, in motivating us to do what we need to do to figure it all out. <laughs>
So that's our that's that's our story. Um, uh, it's hardly surprising then that uh, it took rather a long time that a thinker like Aristotle uh, uh, would not have 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 had the idea, and certainly if he had had the idea, would have dismissed it out of hand. I think that. Uh, uh, forgetting about philosophizing and just focusing on the facts was the way to go. That, he would have said, was irrational. And he would have been right. It is irrational, and yet it works incredibly well. Well, thank you very much. These are some of the ideas in, in my book, uh, The Knowledge Machine. Uh, uh, in there as well, you'll find much more about the way that science works, often uh, somewhat counterintuitive. There I have a uh, for for those of you who are uh, listening or watching in the uh, in North America, there's on the left is the U.S. edition, and on the right the the uh, uh, you can really see that this is a an, a lesson in in, uh, in cultural differences and similarities. The U.K. edition. Um, anyway, I if you're interested, please please take a look. Uh, uh, in any case, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>